Okay, good morning. This is Catherine Ray Scott with Catherine Ray Scott Charities and the Butterfly Hab. And I'm trying to pretend it's morning, but it's already 1.30 in the afternoon. But and even so, <clears throat> I have my cup here this morning. And I want to ask you to go ahead and join me and enjoy uh, your favorite beverage in the morning. And you might want to consider purchasing one of ours. This is a cup that I designed for the NA group that my husband was attending. And I had heard that they say, I am an addict, and then I'm so-and-so. I'm an addict Joe, or I'm an addict Sam, or whatever. And I thought that was really pitiful because they saw themselves as a constant addict rather than <clears throat> having achieved beyond that. So with this cup I designed, it gives a new meaning to what an addict is. I am an addict, alcohol, drug, delivered, individual, confessing Christ. So I thought that might be beneficial for them, and if you think it would be beneficial to a loved one that may be suffering from addiction and is trying to overcome or has overcome, you may consider buying one of these on my Etsy channel called Freedom Warriors US. So it would be etsy.com slash shop slash Freedom Warriors US. And hopefully that'll get you where you want to go. I'll try to put a link either in Facebook or in YouTube, depending on where this gets published. Anyway, today, according to the computer, is March 1st already, 2000, or 20, 20, <laughs> 2022. And today I thought when I woke up in the morning that it was going to be a brief visit with the Father in Heaven as I read the scriptures. But today, he really uh, opened the scriptures to me, and I took a lot of notes. So I'm not going to be able to actually quote verbatim what I felt the Father was saying to me today through the Holy Spirit. But I want to share with you what he said, um, and I have to refer to my notes because I was taking a lot of notes while I uh, was visiting with him today in the scriptures and um, I also want to tell you that I not only use the scriptures but he brought to mind other quotes from other authors and articles and so sometimes I may refer to those as I bring this particular reading um, and understanding forth today to you and today I was reading John 6 and John chapter 6, uh, verse 2 says, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. So he had already saved the people and had given them the Beatitudes in John 5. It was telling them how they have to live as a Christian or should live as a Christian victoriously and how to do that. And even then, more people were following him because they saw how he had healed the diseased. So they were really after the healing more than Christ. But Jesus, fortunately, knows where their hearts are, and he tries to direct them further in uh, John 6 here. But before he did that, according to verse 3 of chapter 6, Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. So why did he go to the mountain? Well, most churches will tell us because, you know, he wanted to get away from the crowd, which I can understand, and he wanted to get further and closer to God. And according to uh, biblical um, symbolism, the mountain represents to contain divine inspiration, thought, and to focus of a pilgrimage of transcendence and spiritual elevation. It is an un... Oh, excuse me. It is a... I can hardly read my own writing. 
Uh, it is the universal symbol of the nearness of God as it surpasses ordinary humanity and extends toward the sky and the heavens. So Jesus left the multitudes for a period of time, went up to the mountain to replenish his soul, is basically what this is saying to us. So as he replenished his soul, uh, he, oh, let me, let me say this. As he was up there replenishing his soul, because the Passover was drawing nigh. So what is the Passover? Well, Jesus is the Passover lamb. We know that from reading the other pieces of scripture. But did the multitudes and the disciples grasp that at the time? So I wanted to kind of go over uh, the verse 4 that says the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. So Jesus knew that the Passover was coming and the sacrificial lamb, which he was, was to be soon sacrificed. And he wanted his disciples to know for sure that he was the lamb of God that would be sufficient for the renewing of the spirit, for the cleansing of the sins and being born again. So I think that's why in verse 4 it mentions the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. Because he had a message there that he wanted to give. And my notes I took was, uh, maybe the Passover uh, verse means that Jesus was preparing his disciples to beware that Jesus was soon to be the Passover spiritual lamb instead of the usual perfect natural lamb slaughtered to celebrate and remember the first Passover when the Jews were to slaughter a lamb and brush the blood of the lamb over the doorpost to protect them from the angel of death as we see explained in Exodus 12. So I think that he was preparing them at this particular time to help them see that he himself was the Passover lamb and there was no longer a need for the blood sacrifices that were taking place at the time in the synagogues and temples. Okay, then moving on to verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Well, it's interesting, and I ask myself, why, why was it that he spoke with Philip? Why wasn't it one of the other individuals that he spoke to? But in the scripture, it clearly states that he spoke with Philip. So I looked up the name Philip, and I found that it means one who leans on his military complex, one who loves, not necessarily meaning feelings between people, but rather it is a state of alignment and coexistence or even uh, symbios, symbios. Plus that word Philip means uh, hmm, phileo, the word love in the scriptures, in the Greek. But what we're trying to see here is that Philip was chosen particularly because I believe Jesus was trying to tell us in our day and age that there was a great love between him and the disciples and the great love is passed down to us. And Philip was the example of that because He's stating that we are in alignment, or he is in alignment and in coexistence in giving this message to the multitudes that follow. I hope that makes sense to people. So, what I'm trying to say is, Philip means love also means of horses. That's why it has that military connotation to it. But in everyday language, it means that there was a, 
I don't know how to say that word. Sin, sin, whatever. Closeness, symbiosis, relationship, intertwined, which is what Jesus is trying to tell us, that he's intertwined with his people. Okay. <laughs> now, what was next is... Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? It's interesting to note why he would ask Philip that. Why would he ask, you know, where are we going to get the money to buy the bread? And it says in verse 6, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So in other words, Jesus already knew the answer to what he had asked in verse 5, where are we going to get all the money? What's the interesting part is, that Philip in verse 7 answered and said, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. And that's very significant. I don't generally uh, tear apart the scriptures like I have been as of late because I usually just gloss over that. But the 200 penny worth has a lot of symbolic meaning and the word 200 actually means insufficiency so this verse 7 when Philip says that 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient that's very significant that it's not sufficient and I believe it means the insufficiency of money to save someone from the consequences of sin for example in Achan and who was in Jericho taking the 200 shekels of silver ended in Achan's death. And you can find the story of that in Joshua 7. And then another example of the meaning of 200 and the fact that it means insufficiency is found in the story of Micah, who took the silver idol that was made of 200 shekels of silver that his mother had made from that silver and melted it down and made this idol. Well, Micah took the silver and then started to uh, make his own house of worship. And over time, this resembled, re, became responsible for the idolist worship. And it grew and grew and grew and was adopted by Dan, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And when we ask ourselves, why isn't Dan mentioned in the 12 tribes in, in uh, Revelation? I believe it is because Dan's tribe uh, represents man's insufficiency of man-made religion. It will not please God, and therefore he was not allowed to be in the 12 tribes mentioned in Revelation. So, verse 7 of John 6 seems to be stating Philip's understanding that naturally this insufficient or insufficiency will not satisfy the multitudes. And you have to remember the multitudes were people or humanity and represent all of humanity, even all us today and the point is that no amount of money can be used to save us you can't buy the Holy Spirit you can't buy salvation you have to go through the door of Christ so Jesus knows that and is helping Philip to realize that according to the previous verse cuz Jesus knew what he would do and I might add, Jesus knew he alone was the bread of life sent from heaven, Matthew 6, 11, meaning ultimately only Jesus can satisfy our deepest needs and longings. And he alone makes us feel full and content, overflowing with blessings. So it's he alone. That's what the message is so far stating here in John 6, that he alone is the sufficiency. He alone is the bread of life. He alone is the one that you have to feed upon because nothing else is going to satisfy and he's trying to get this message across then and today 
Then I jump down to verse 9. There is a lad there which had five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? It's interesting here, too. Why five barley loaves? Why five? And for those who may not know, five in the biblical sense means God's grace or God's breath of life. And barley symbolizes the common fodder or the ordinary people like you and me. It's just the ordinary people. And the loaves represents God himself, which is the bread of life, Jesus. So the two small fishes seem to represent two, excuse me, two uh, dichotomies. It represents a unity of two becoming one. As an example, man and wife, when they are joined together, they become one. Uh, another example of two becoming one is the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when they are together, they are one. It's the testimony of Christ. And another example would be the Old and New Covenant as one is of the law and one is written on the heart of people of man represents the heavenly and the spiritual being combined. And two witnesses are required in the scriptures to bear witness of truth or untruth, which means they come to one truth. So the two witnesses there become one in their statements. And then two also symbolizes the connection between God or Jesus and the church. And you can see all of that in uh, Corinthians 12. So as I was still learning what the Father had to say, it says here that the fish represents God's ultimate provision through his death and resurrection. The symbolism of the fish as provision is further carried out with the fish that provides the temple tax for Jesus and his disciples in Matthew 17, 24 through 27. Then skipping down to verse 10, and Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. And I thought it interesting. Why would they mention that there's much grass? Who cares? You know, who cares? Well, as the Holy Spirit was uh, continuing to reveal to me what the scripture says, uh, what came to mind was that the men did sit down in the, in the much grass. And when we think of much grass, I think of uh, Psalm 23, 2, where we may find the answer. Because Psalm 23, 2 says, He maketh me to... Lie down in green pastures. But in the Hebrew, that actually says, uh, in pastures of grass, he makes me to lie down. So we know that there's some sort of a connection here. And what does that mean? Well, this means that God is our provision. God is our protection. God is our shepherd. God is the one who's bringing us comfort. So he has asked the multitude of 5,000 men to seat themselves, sit in the much grass, symbolizing, in my opinion, that he has much comfort to offer, much provision to offer, much grace to offer, much bread of life to offer. Now, we ask ourselves while we're in the same verse, why was it 5,000 men? And I've heard a lot of preachers say of 5,000 men and many, many others, so he was really a large multitude of people. I think that maybe so, maybe not. I think that the message is more uh, in tune with why the term and the new number 5,000. Why would the Bible say 5,000. So when I looked up um, 5,000, what immediately came to mind was five means grace and breath. Um, the 
He is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that means breath. And oftentimes, five is referred to as the grace of God. So here we have 5,000 men sitting in the grass in the comfort that God has provided, and he's sharing with us that this is much grace. This is much the breath of life. This is much what I have to offer you today. It's interesting to also note that 5,000 has the 000 after it. And what does the uh, three zeros represent in this 5,000 from biblical numerology? And from what I can see, the three zeros, the three meaning the divine, and that's an interesting point I want to go over because it's kind of like more than the divine. It's kind of like God, who is the divine, and only one. And then two is man. And one and two equals three, which is the divine, everything combined. It doesn't eliminate the man. It doesn't eliminate God. But it brings them together to make the more perfect, if that's possible, um, divine situation, the divine entity. The zeros represent something to the effect that it's zero. Zero means zero. There's nothing there. Yet, it encompasses everything. That's an odd thing, but it does. And therefore, the zeros in the various numerological systems represents and signifies a return to the absolute freedom and to God. In other words, we have nothing going with us. It's just us and God. That's all he wants, us and God, to be there. Jesus said he's the way that, well, no, let's go back. Jesus says, I am the door. And he says that we're supposed to walk on the narrow path. Well, walking on the narrow path means that nothing else can go with you on that narrow path. That path is so narrow that we have to drop all the burdens that we carry. We have to drop all of the uh, bitterness that we carry. We drop all the diseases that we carry. We drop all of the prejudices that we carry. We drop all of our possessions that we carry. We drop all of our worries that we carry. We drop all of the um, sense of loss and we drop all of the sense of self-importance and we drop all the sense of everything about us and solely are nothing as we walk through the door and meet the Savior who is standing at the door. So, I like the thought of, for instance, in the sky, when you look up there in the dark just before the stars come out, it's completely dark. Completely dark. So there's zero things up there. But the stars come through. So it's all, it's all nothing. And then it's everything all of a sudden. It's everything. So uh, in my opinion, the three zeros then represent God the Divine, the Holy One. And it also stands for the one and only God. And two, who is mankind. And then that equals three which is the absolute perfection and divine that God has in mind for reconciliation with himself, with man. Or man reconciled, is reconciled to God through Christ. So the one stands for God, which is unity, agreement, and simplicity, and one remains at complete peace without regard for anything else. And two symbolizes duality, tension, and complexity. Three represents the harmony that includes the synthesis of the two opposites. The unity symbolizes by the number three isn't accomplished by getting rid of the two. 
the entity that causes discord reverting to the unity symbolized by the number one rather three merges the two to create a new entity one that harmonizes and includes both of the opposites that's kind of hard to probably understand on here and I'm going to try to make it clearer but the way I understand it for instance in the Garden of Eden God placed man and he made the garden well what happened there was without God man had nothing and without man God didn't have a tender to the garden, a, a, a gardener. He didn't have a gardener. So he placed those responsibilities on Adam. And so God and man working together has the complete picture, the complete entity, the complete system that works. God, because we can't do anything without God, and he chooses to use man to complete the picture, to complete the work, to complete the purpose. And that's what the third entity is, is God and man together. So we have God as number one, man as number two, and then number three would be God and man working together, the three different entities, if you can grab that. So what I'm trying to say is, here I'll try to give it in this example. Entity A leaves no room for entity B. In other words, A, which is one, and B, which is two. And entity B leaves no room or allows the existence of entity A. So entity demonstrates how A and B are compatible and even complementary, bringing together the two opposites, the A and the B, requires the introduction of an entity or common goal, C, that is greater than both of them, greater than the A and greater than the B. In essence, God with man is greater than God by himself, and man alone is that entity against God. So it takes God and man to get this perfect thing that God has purposed, it seems to me. So I went over already what it's kind of like the Garden of Eden where God created the garden. They put man in there to dress it and to keep it and God made man and God working together and it was the same with God's grace and salvation I thought this was very interesting that was revealed to me a lot of people say oh you're saved by grace you're saved by grace you're saved by grace which is true we are <laughs> but there's another part to that it's kind of like there's one part and then there's another part and then that equals the whole part which is really where the salvation is so let me explain God gives the grace and salvation. And he gives it, but man must work it out. Man must work it out. And I think that, oh shoot, I don't think I made the reference to that, but it's in Timothy uh, somewhere. Shoot, I don't remember exactly, so that's assignment for you all. It's in Timothy somewhere it's where it says, work out your own salvation. The reason that's in there is because it's like being married. When you get married, the man and the woman are together. They are now married. No matter what happens after that, they are married. But you can have a really wholesome, happy, successful, content marriage because you worked at it. Or you can have a marriage that's absolutely miserable and you find yourselves being separated from each other because there was no time spent working towards the marriage and making it happy and successful. And that's the way it is with salvation. We are saved 
but we don't really have sanctification. Well, we do because he sets us aside for his purposes, but somehow we don't have a satisfying salvation, I guess is what I want to say. And it's because we have not worked out our salvation. So it needs to be worked out onto good works. We read the scriptures, we read the word, we pray, we ask God for guidance, we memorize scripture, we seek his thoughts, his renewing of our mind and our spirit, and we become closer in a relationship as a result. That's what I mean by uh, God and man working together. And another thing I want to show as an example of this principle in the scripture of one God and then man and then the three together are um, greater than the first entity and the second entity. Greater than God, greater than man is God and man together. And here's the principle. In the beginning, in the days of creation, in Genesis, we read that the first three days of creation serve as an example of these three stages and principle. One, the first day. Life had not yet been created, and at the conclusion of the first day, the scripture says it was evening and it was morning one day. And God was the only existence at that time. Even the angels had not been created. There was a complete, simple unity, and there was one. There was one. Then on the second day of creation, it symbolizes separation and discord, because what happened was on that day, God separated the waters above the heavens from the waters below the heavens, and this generated the first dichotomy. Now there was two opposites, heaven and earth spirituality and physicality. Unlike the five days of creation regarding the second day, the scripture account doesn't say that God saw that it was good. When there is conflict and tension, the situation cannot be qualified as good. So check it out. On the second day, did God say it is good? Prove me wrong. Prove me right. Just go check it out yourself. Then on the third day, God confined the waters to the seas and uncovered the dry land, which allowed for the creation of vegetation later that day. Now the light and dark, the heaven, the earth, and the waters were working in harmony to produce. On the third day, it says in the scriptures that God said, it is good. Twice. Twice. So, why did he say twice? The third day didn't undo the separation of the first two days. The polarity still existed. But the polarity became part of a greater unity, and that unity is double Good. That's the principle. So the one God, two man, three God and man together as the third entity is double good according to the principles of the scripture. So going over that again, when two opposite merge and work together, the resulting unity is greater than the unity of the one being on its own. Because the number one symbolizes peace, that is achieved by the exclusion of all others. In summary, one stands for unity, two stands for disagreement, and the three stands for the harmony of this unity and disagreement. Excuse me. And the three stands for that, a harmony of the opposites that includes the properties of the one and two entities. Now, it's interesting, the same mathematical principle is true in marriage. These three levels are demonstrated, again, like I said, in a marriage that God has put together. You have uh, 
man and wife. The man by himself is alone. He may have peace. <laughs> he may have peace by then. But um, he's unfulfilled. So he gets married. So now we have two. And there's now opposition. There is conflict because there's two individuals involved. I mean, wherever you have two individuals involved, there's going to be some sort of disagreements and some sort of whatevers. But the main principle here is that when the two become one, as God had intended, that's why they're put together, they become one. That one entity is greater than the, each of those two individuals. It's a greater product, a greater um, manifestation, I guess you would say, of what God has in mind for us. To do it alone, I, how do I want to say that? To do it alone is okay. To have conflict is okay because it's supposed to bring about the unity that comes when one and two work together. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> Getting back to John 6, in verse 12, this is really what I want to say. When they were filled, notice that the bread of life, Jesus, had completely filled and satisfied the multitudes. Now, remember, the multitudes are us today as well. Multitudes, then and now. Multitudes of people. We have 7 billion people on earth, so he has lots of multitudes. But in this case, he instructed his disciples to gather up the fragments that remain. That represents the broken body of Christ and, in my opinion, the church today. The broken body. We are the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And we are definitely broken. But notice, he wants them all, all those fragments gathered up so that nothing be lost. Nothing be lost is the key thought here. It is God's desire that none be lost. 2 Peter 3, 9. It is his will. None should perish, hoping all will come to repentance. So notice in verse 13 that the disciples, them and us, gathered up the fragments and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the original five loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Why mention that there was 12 baskets? What's the significance of 12? <clears throat> well, 12 symbolizes total perfection of rule and government. 12 is the product of three which signifies the divine process, and four, which signifies the earthy process, and 12 represents the authority, appointment, and completeness. The number 12 seems to be also associated with the government of the cosmos. So with all that said, let's summarize the overall meaning of John Six, three through 13. It appears to me to say, Jesus saw the multitudes in need of truth. Jesus having gone up to the mountain to be nearer to God, to experience divine inspiration and spiritual elevation, and to be at one with the God in truth. Jesus is the truth, according to John 14, 6. So we have all the truth there. So looking down on the multitude, humanity, all of us. See, that's amazing, isn't it? All of us. It wasn't just that multitude, I don't think. I think Christ actually saw all of humanity from then until the present. I mean, that's amazing. And the Passover was drawing nigh, so Jesus is showing himself as the Lamb of God that will be the slaughtered one and has been 
slaughtered for us for the remission of all the sins of the multitude. Again, humanity, all of the world. John 3.16 and 17, most everybody realizes what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should have everlasting life. And then verse 17, He came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Might be saved. That's the one I want you to catch, because you do have to follow, follow the rules of the kingdom, so to speak. And then John 11, no, John 1, 29 and 36. Um, let's just go back over there and see what that says, because I don't remember offhand. Okay. Okay, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So... He is reminding the world that he is the lamb of the world. Then in verse 5, we have Philip. Why is it that Philip mentioned and not a different disciple? It's because Philip symbolically represents love in Greek. And it means a mighty association with the military. So Philip means literally love of horses, but symbolically means love not so much as in feelings, but in the state of alignment called existence and a symbiance, symbiance or however you say that, living together in benefit of one and another. So it's like he's the militant one. I'm the one, Jesus is saying, I'm the militant one. I am at war with us, evil. I am in love with you all. This is why I chose Philip as the one I'm giving you in the message here. So that you realize that I love you as though you were myself. That I'm in complete uh, symbiosis relationship. Because we live because of him. And he wants us and he benefits somehow. And I don't know how that is. So the scripture is telling us that Jesus is at one with us, desires a close relationship with us that benefits each of us. And John 15 speaks of that in that he says of abiding in close uh, relationship when he says he is the vine and we are the branches. If we abide in him, we have life. But if the Branches are separated from the vine, they die. See, this is a truth that we have to realize. There's so many of us saved by grace, saved by grace, saved by grace. But if we separate ourselves from God, from the vine, we're dead. And if you're on a farm or do nursery work of any kind, if you chop a, a vine branch off of the vine, I mean, it dies. So... Just keep that in mind. In verse 5 and 6, when Jesus asked Philip, uh, whence shall we buy bread? He is making it clear to Philip and us that no amount of physical bread alone will satisfy the hungry. References, no man shall live by bread alone, but by every word out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. We see the second witness to this fact in verse Seven, where the 200 penny worth is not sufficient for them. 200 symbolically meaning not sufficient. Indicating Jesus is saying to us, no amount of money is sufficient to satisfy the soul and give fullness of spirit. Then in verse 9, there was five barley loaves, five meaning grace and breath. And Jesus is giving the message. He is abounding in grace. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, I hope you'll look them up, giving all grace to us that we may abound in grace, that we may have all sufficiency in all things and have abundance for every good work. You notice why he gives us grace? He gives us grace so that we can have an abundance of good work. We don't get it just to have it. The two fishes represent 
the dichotomy and divisiveness of man, which is the, represented uh, symbolically as the fish, and it uh, represents the dichotomy of the spiritual and the physical. And Jesus' interest in man, since he says in Matt 419, Matthew 419, I will make you fishers of men, showing his desire that man follow him, bringing man and God together, bringing the physical and the spiritual in harmony, working as one toward the divine and peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, it says in the Beatitudes. So verse 10, Jesus makes the men, us, to sit in much grass, meaning he will comfort them and us and fill us and them and provide all of their needs and all of our needs. That's what the message is. And verse 11, notice what it says. Jesus took the loaves, had given thanks, and he distributed the loaves among those seated. In other words, he thanked God for his mission, that of being the bread of life to mankind, gave to all who asked, and were seated in the grass. Those were comforted and obedient in him. Notice he gave them to the ones that were seated in the grass. They were seated in his comfort. They were seated in his rest. They were seated in his kingdom. They were seated in obedience to the Lord. And then verse 12 says, All were filled by the bread of life, and there is plenty more to go around. Verse 13, 12 baskets were filled, meaning, Folks, I've got this all under control. I've got this authority. I've got the perfect government set up. I've got power. I have completeness. I am that I am. And the Father has given me all authority, power, government, perfection, grace, salvation, bread of life, fishermen of, fisher, fishers of men, word of God, lamb of God, truth, grace, to give all to all who will come unto me, John 6, 37. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am the bridge. I am the gateway that brings God and man together. I am the door. I am the manna from heaven. I am the lamb offering. I am. I am all in all. I am God and there is none other. Isaiah 45, 5. I am the fountain of life. Frankly, this message I heard from God today makes me tremble and quake. Do you know God? Do you fear him? Do you have a sense of awe and submission to God? Please read Psalm 1, 11, 10. Psalm, Pro, or excuse me, Proverbs 1, 7. Proverbs 14, 27. Proverbs 9, 10. They all speak of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One. And in that is understanding. And I want to challenge you today. John Joshua 24:14 telling you just as Joshua did at that time he says now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord the gods of Egypt represent ourselves narcissism narciss and selfishness and our material things and our comfort and our wealth our idols of anything that is above god so he's saying put those aside and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day who ye shall serve, whether the gods of which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. 
but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I hope to say that for my entire family, that we too will serve the Lord. And I hope you will too. I hope all who are listening will also make the same decision today until we meet again. May God's love and peace and holiness be upon you today as if as when you turn your life over completely to the living God today. So that was uh, kind of long, but it was the message that I believed God had given me today, and I couldn't believe it. I was up from 6 to 1 o'clock, 6 in the morning until 1 o'clock this afternoon, um, getting that message and writing it. And now it's, what, 2.15 or so. And putting it on the air. So, I don't know how it's going to go. That's in God's hands. But I do wish you all well. And I do thank you for listening. I hope that you can truly understand how wonderful and how complete God is. And that you will yield your life over to him. That's what's most important in these last days. I mean, I don't know how close we are to the coming of the Father. Um, I just don't know. But... I do know that we don't know when our time is up, when God will call us home. And are you ready? Are you ready if you should go today or this afternoon or tomorrow? Are you ready? Do you have your life right before Christ? That's all I'm asking, and I hope you do, and I pray that you do. Again, thank you for listening, and we'll talk soon again, I hope, and I hope you'll watch me again. All right, Lord bless and keep you. Until next time.